Hi, everyone. This is Raquel. Hi, and this is Jennifer. Welcome to Madness Cafe. This is a feminist podcast where we talk about women's issues, politics, and health and wellness. And where those issues intersect. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Madness Cafe. Today is another episode of Book Chat, and it's just going to be me and Jennifer. Book Chat, Book Chat. It's going to be just me and Jennifer, and we're going to talk about this book right here. It's called A Well-Trained Wife, My Escape from Christian Patriarchy by Tia Levings. If you guys have not heard of Tia Levings, pay attention because she's got some really important stuff to say. She also was in the documentary Shiny Happy People, which is on Amazon. I know I watched that uh, that documentary when it first came out. I need to rewatch it, honestly. But yeah, she was a part of that documentary and it has a lot to do with basically Christian patriarchy, which is becoming more and more and more entwined in our political landscape. So this particular book is about Tia's experience as a wife in Christian patriarchy and her escape from it, as the title says. So I'm not giving anything away by saying that she escaped it. But yeah, so we're going to talk about that book. Jennifer, do you want to do you want to start off? Yeah, I read the book quite a few months ago because I couldn't wait to read it when I first got my hands on it. I think I took it on vacation and read it very quickly, which is why it's all messed up. (laughs) But I was looking through it today and I remembered why I loved it so much. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I wrote so many pieces from this book that I could talk about, read out loud, underline. Mm-hmm. There's so many things, but I guess what I'll start with is all the way to the back of the book on page 275, she says, remembering that IBLP, which we've talked about on other podcasts, mm-hmm. school groups want to run our country the way they run their homes. I think this part ties so clearly into project 2025 which is something Mm -hmm. we'll be talking on a a later episode but i don't see how we can talk about this episode without talking about that episode yeah yeah so she says the homeschool groups want to run our country this way they want to run their homes i suddenly realized why it mattered so much that i talk about what it's like in those households i could tell them what it's really like no female vote no consent no contraception no choice no careers courtship marriages, stay-at-home daughters, and parentified older siblings, closets, suppressions, book bans, harsh discipline, rigid roles, high control, shame. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I underline the same thing. And then I also under a bit more where it said, it goes in the next paragraph, bad for anyone except a straight white patriarch. And I knew from experience it wasn't really good or healthy for them either. We all deserve better. Yeah. yeah. And I think one of the things that we've tried to talk about since the very beginning of this podcast is patriarchy is just as bad for men as it is for women, maybe in some ways even more insidious. I recently heard Tia on a podcast and she said that she's not really even calling it Christian patriarchy anymore. Mm-hmm. She's calling it fundamentalist patriarchy. Mm, to- yeah. Yeah. I heard that too. I think she also called it um, evangelical patriarchy was another term for it yeah really call out that this is a movement in our country Mm -hmm. yeah yeah that it's not just someone kind of sitting there being a christian patriarch on their own there's proselytizing involved in this there is it is evangelical it is the the ideal behind it is to spread it around the world and kate west talked about that a bit as well when we talked to her you know it's the whole idea of dominion basically of going out and you know kind of and 
taking over the world. I mean, it, it sounds like I'm being hyperbolic, but I'm not. That's exactly what it is. And there was a, an, another podcast. I'm not sure if this is the same episode that you listened to, but there was a podcast that Tia was on where the woman interviewing her uh, was talking about a guest that w- that had been at her house and the, this couple was you know very uh, religious and they had talked about how they had traveled a lot and basically they were doing mission work and yeah. so think about it I mean all of the like I think we all know somebody who has gone on a mission trip with their church or you know or whatever and I'm not saying that everybody who has gone on these mission trips is thinking that they're going to take over the world. I'm not saying that, but the idea behind it is very rooted in, yeah, it's ethnocentric. It's rooted in colonialism. It's rooted in uh, entitlement that, you know, that your way of living and that your uh, ideas about religion are needed to go in and quote unquote save people yeah uh and and basically it's it's white supremacy in action whether the everybody who's doing it realizes it or are going into it with that thought that's not the point the the idea behind it is that it's it is a tool of colonialism and white supremacy yeah i did listen to that same podcast it was called indoctrination yes yes podcast by rachel bernstein yes LMP. i actually decided to subscribe to that podcast because i was very interested in the way she discussed this with tia mm-hmm. yeah i also have had a lot of thoughts about that as an ex-peace corps volunteer mm. granted Peace Corps, we weren't going to other countries to teach religion. Mm-hmm. I think I've said this before on the podcast. While I was there, I did run into some nuns that were there, mm-hmm. French, they were French nuns who were doing some sort of indoctrination, I would yeah. say. Yeah. And I was very uncomfortable with that. But at the time, I didn't realize my own ethnocentric ideas of somehow I was this white savior that was going to come teach what and like I've said before they kept me alive yeah that is the truth of the of the matter but I do think we have this idea in this country that we can save people and one Mm -hmm. of the things I liked that Rachel said on that podcast was that we sometimes go out with this idea to save people before even checking in with them. Like, how are you doing? Mm -hmm. What's going on? Do you need saving? Yeah. Now, granted, there are people around the world that need food and maybe they need some sanitation, latrines, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But how are we approaching that? Are we approaching that as a mission who's saving them with Jesus and latrines at the same time? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I think there is a lot of that. And granted, you know, I'm saying all this. I've not, I've not gone on a mission trip. I'm not a religious person. Organized religion makes me really nervous. And and I've not done Peace Corps. But these haven't are, you, these are just my thoughts. But haven't you had people like I've I've at least two men that I've met in my life that thought it was their mission to save me? Oh yeah. They wanted yeah, to date yeah. me and then teach me about Jesus and save my yeah, poor yeah. future soul. Yeah. I did do, now that I'm thinking about it, I did do, there's this thing at Vanderbilt called alternative spring break where it's kind of like you go and volunteer somewhere for during your spring break, as opposed to just like doing what college kids normally do, like go to the beach or go hang with their friends or do whatever and we were we were supposed to be helping to teach 
Guatemalan refugees in a very small town in Florida how to speak English hmm. and supposed to be helping them with something else too. And I don't remember what else we were supposed to be doing, but I know I didn't teach anybody a damn thing. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Literally was just like, I don't really know why we're here. Like I'm sure somebody on this trip is doing something significant and important, but it wasn't me. I didn't do shit literally because I didn't know what I was supposed to be doing and I really didn't feel like it, everything was directed very well like at on our little trip at our little group other groups did great because I know friends who've done them and they were great but the one that I was on was not so that's the closest that I've gotten to anything like that and I can say that I for one was not helpful <laughs> I get that. I get that. But I do see a value in teaching English skills to people living in an English speaking culture because right. it helps them to, gosh, assimilate is such a bad word. Well, it, it helps them to, to achieve what they need to achieve, right? It helps them to get a job. It helps them to find a place to live. It helps them to know what's happening. Like, if I plopped, you know, my ass down in the middle of France, I might want to learn some French if I'm going to stay there for any significant amount of time. Right. And it would be nice if someone taught me. Right. So I get what you're, I get what you're saying. Right. Yeah. That's a skill. However, are we teaching English from the Christian primer or are we teaching English from textbooks from, I mean, what are we <laughs> yeah. in English from? Exactly. Exactly. Right. Yeah. That's, think, that's the important thing, I think. Well, I think one of the things we've learned from both Tia's book, A Well-Trained Royce, and Kate West's book, Rift, and I'm trying to think of Sa the- Sarah Stancorp's book, um, Diso was Disobedient, Disobedient Women. Women. Yeah. I, and I have it right here on my- All of case. them talk about the prevalence of Christian schools, and mm -hmm. then even one step further- the homeschooling movement, which is teaching from these primers, mm -hmm. teaching a very select history, a very select English, a very select mm -hmm. math. Maybe these kids, and also I saw on Happy Shiny People, Shiny Happy People, mm -hmm. yeah, those kids talking about their homeschooling experience that they they have such a huge hole in their knowledge. Mm -hmm. Try and go out into quote the world yeah so yeah are we are we going on this mission to actually teach english or are we going on the mission to teach the bible or t in, in, in even different from yeah, the bible yeah you're, you're those missions are being done to spread dogma the gospel yeah yeah. No, and I and I know I'm I'm not the best person to talk about a lot of that because, like I said, I mean I'm organized religion, uh, very dogmatic religion makes me very 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 uncomfortable, and and I think always has. Yeah. So what did you learn? What's the what was your key takeaway from this book? I don't know if this was my key takeaway but it, I think it was a pretty significant one from this book and then also from from Kate's book is that Tia and Kate deep down had a very strong sense of self yes it had gotten pushed down and beaten down and diluted and in, in Tia's case, I mean, basically had also been beaten out of her because we know from reading the book that her, her husband was incredibly abusive and took full advantage of the, the idea of head of household spanking, which was, you know, one of the tenets that the fundamentalists and covenantists were pushing forward. But all of this was happening 
but still there was something in them that kept rising up and that was the thing that saved them these are two women who are very 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 strong in who they are and and they kept they kept finding a way to get back to it and they kept coming back to ways of expressing that and for both of them interestingly enough writing was a huge part of that for both of them writing and reading and connecting with other people um like tia talks about trapdoor uh the the online community that she that she found and became involved with and that literally saved her and her children's lives when they were fleeing um and so I think that that's something that that I came away from this book with is that you know only so much can be pushed down and eventually it's going to rise up eventually people people truly come into their own when either they have the opportunity or they're kind of forced to yeah and thankfully Tia got to that point before her husband was able to permanently stop her kill her yeah to kill her yeah yeah and so yeah so I just I have a lot of respect for the way that that Tia and and Kate both paid attention to that part of themselves and yeah they had to do this whole separation thing where they had to keep these parts of themselves separate but eventually it won out and now they're they're telling their stories and they're helping other people who are who are escaping similar situations right and I'm sure that's the hope of both the books is to speak to all of those children, women who are still. And some men. And some men. Yes, you're right. You're right. It's interesting because when we started with Sarah and her book, Disobedient Women, that's the first time we heard of the umbrella of protection. Mm -hmm. You've got God at the top and then your religious leaders and then you've got the man and then you've got the woman and then you've got the children and mm -hmm. I find myself thinking as I've heard this repeated now and I also saw it on shiny happy people that god damn what it must be like to be one of those kids yeah to go through blanket training did you read about yeah that? yeah so the whole premise is they put a baby on a mat mm -hmm. and then on a blanket it, and then put a toy or something it might want just slightly out of its reach. And every time it reaches, the baby reaches for the toy, you smack it. Yeah. Or put it, tell it no, smack it until it no longer wants what it wants. Yeah. This is an infant. This is not, this is not, this is pre-verbal for the mm -hmm. infant. Mm -hmm. So you're like, ah, uh, no, ah, uh, no. This is worse than the whole crying out movement. Cry yeah. It out. So to me, that's like, that speaks to power over domination. Mm -hmm. The child must submit their whole life is like that. And then people will say, oh, well, why didn't these women leave their abusive uh, situations? Well, they didn't even have the word to say no or yes. Yeah, they didn't, they didn't think that they could. And, and where were they going to go? They didn't right. know where they were going to go. I mean, they were, they were so isolated. And I mean, even Tia talks about, yes, they did, you know, scouts and all these things and, but she still kept up appearances. Right. You that know, her... yeah. The neighbors didn't know just how different their family life was, you know, I mean, that, that was her job to not tell those things. Did you watch the Duggars when it came out that show 19 and counting? You know, just every once in a while, I'd catch an episode here and there or like pieces of an episode, but I didn't, I wasn't a regular viewer. Were you? No, I watched it maybe once or twice, but what I do recall is seeing their faces on People Magazine. Yes. 
back in the time, like they were splashed all over they were the media. Everywhere. I kept thinking to myself, now that's a little fucking weird. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. Like, I don't want 19 kids. Yeah. Yeah. I thought that was very strange. I was like, so I, I do remember thinking, oh my God, why do they have so many children? And B, how in the hell are they able to feed mm-hmm. and clothe all of those children? I just remember thinking it's hard enough for families with one child. It's expensive, right? right? God help you when that kid becomes a teenager and then they're eating you out of house and home or like when they're babies and they're growing, I mean, you have to buy new clothes like every 20 minutes. I mean, cause they're growing so quickly. Like, how are you doing that for 19? And then I started thinking this woman has been pregnant her entire life. Oh yeah, she's been pregnant at least. What the hell? Yeah, and what does that do to a person's body like that? I that's where I, that's where my mind went during that whole thing is like. Yeah, but if you're okay, so if you're that woman and and Mrs. Duggar, I forget what her name is. She it doesn't it doesn't matter what her name is. She went on with her little baby. Do you know what I mean? Like they, she's the woman. They don't. It doesn't matter what her name is. So she went on with her little baby fundy voice and like praised her wearing her her jumpsuit that covered her down to her yeah, her, her dress yeah. yeah and talked about how great it was but even if she wanted to say to her husband nah no more babies we're not having any more sex in the fundamentalist christian movement that's not her right to do so mm-mm, mm-mm. she has to be available to make if, babies 24 yep. 7 that's her role that's her duty that's defined mm-hmm. and I it's the man's said. job to if she you know to basically make her submit and i remember tia saying again there's no such thing as marital rape that doesn't exist yeah you just yeah. you you just roll over and bear it yeah your body as a fundamentalist woman is not your own it is not at all it is not your own. And I would say that's probably true of fundamentalists in any country. Yeah. Not just Christian fundamentalists. Yeah. Yeah. Although I don't it, know that for sure. Yeah. I, do. I could pick something to read from every single page of this book. So I'm just going to randomly. Do it. Pull. Do it. Oh, oh, you know what? But before we, before we move on, because we were just talking about how the man is the head of the household and it was his job to basically it was his job to make the woman submit It's his job to keep his family in line and as I was also flipping through found a part that I had underlined (laughs) and so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna read this because I think this speaks to what we're talking about she refers to Doug and that's Doug Phillips who was one of the leaders in this whole Christian patriarchy movement. I mean, she says, Doug led men on issues that mattered to patriarchal leaders, male dominance, Christian dominion, female submission, child discipline, political influence, and titanic level valor. The ideal vision forum father cared about what happened in Washington, taught his boy to be a rough and tumble man, taught his daughter to shave his face and serve him, and kept his wife fruitfully multiplying. Fruitfully multiplying. Fruitfully. Yes. Not want to fruitfully multiply. Yeah. And and his daughter to serve him. So, so the page that I randomly opened to, mm-hmm. page 199 said, I spent a lifetime hearing women utterly dependent on man, but now it felt flipped on its head. What if men insisted we needed them so much because they really needed us? Yes. Yes. And what, wait, what page was that? That was 129? 189. 189. Okay. So. Yeah. What if that's the whole point of Christian fundamentalists is that women are the child bearing women Mm -hmm. sort of hold the power in some ways. What if the whole movement 
is because they really need us, but they're too afraid to say so in a, I think, in a real man way. Because, so that mean, because that means that women have the power and God forbid, literally, that women have power. The power is only supposed to be in the hands of and in the body of and in the soul of and the role of the male patriarch, the Christian white male patriarch. That's it. So yeah. what's interesting to me about the whole thing, about Tia's book, about Kate's book, about Sarah's book, and about that show, Shiny, Shiny Happy People, mm -hmm. all of them said that their role as the woman was to keep the husband's secrets mm -hmm. and to keep up appearances of the family, to make them look yeah. happy and shiny and beautiful. Yeah. If everybody's realizing that they're doing that, that they're they're keeping secrets and keeping up appearances, why doesn't that say signal wrong, wrong, wrong? Hey, something's going wrong here. Because I think this comes back to the indoctrination portion of if you don't follow these rules, you will go to hell. And Tia talks about how growing up, they would see these, um, they would be shown these movies mm. um, about the rapture and about being, if you don't, if you don't follow the rules and if you don't follow God, um, then you will be left behind and you will be beheaded or you will go to hell and hell was hell was depicted as a very real and horrible thing like I remember as a kid and again I'm not very religious my mom did try to take us to church a little bit because my mom has a certain personal faith and belief and the whole idea about hell literally scared the living shit out of me and I was like I don't want that that's awful why are little kids being told about that this is crazy it's worse than a horror movie yeah yeah and then I remember thinking like even as a little kid like isn't God supposed to be good like why are people talking about why is there even hell like what what's the like, it just didn't make sense to so me. So we've made God, the religious figure, the man in the house, we've made them into this scary, controlling, evil is not... Uh, 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 vicious, vindictive, vindictive punishing, um, jealous, punishing... The whole have no idols before me. So the idea of a very jealous God. I mean, just like all of that just seems very rooted in human yeah. emotion. And isn't yeah. God supposed to be above humans? Like what? Why? Because Oh, oh, that's right. Because the Bible was written by men. I'm Somebody, crazy. somebody's going to write to me and be like, Raquel, you're going straight to hell. I know. I know all my friends gonna be there. It's all right. I'm gonna have company. <laughs> I don't even believe in hell. <laughs> On page 16, we had a mission to take dominion because lost people without Jesus kill babies. The next movie day included trash cans full of ground up baby body parts, piles of tiny infant hands reaching out for life and half formed skulls with the brains drained out. It was way worse than anything I'd seen on cable. This is what liberals want, they said. This is what will happen if we don't reverse Roe versus Wade. We pledged to vote right for life when we were old enough because nothing mattered more than saving the unborn and leading them to Christ. Yes. Yeah. And, yeah, and on uh, one of the episodes that I listened to, the one of the podcast episodes that Tia was interviewed on, she actually mentions that those films were debunked but as having been completely false and basically they weren't showing baby parts they it was pig parts and like ground up like 
pig parts poor pig you know to their kids to watch an educational program Mm -hmm. for domination control voting rights voting suppression yeah yeah and and this was when she was growing up so they were talking about reversing roe versus wade back to project 2025 the christian or evangelistic patriarchal system yeah. has been in place and ready to swoop in oh yeah they've been planning this shit since roe v wade was originally ruled i believe like, before oh well yeah yeah because you know the the ideas were changing and they didn't like that like actually what was it that i watched oh crap i watched something the other day where it talked about how this all started well before roe v wade it started basically Back during World War II, when women had to enter the workforce because all the men were shipped off to war. And when the men came back, the women were like, yeah, I like having my own job and having my own money and sorry. And so that's when that's when this shift started to happen. So this shit has been in the works since before you and I were even born. So basically... It is about women fulfilling an unpaid labor role in the households, Mm -hmm. making children, cooking food, cleaning the house, taking care of men, pressing their suits, getting them off to work Mm -hmm. so that women fulfill that role so men can go fulfill whatever their destiny is. Yeah. Yeah. My grandmother was one of those rosy riveters in the war. She had her own job for the first time. She never talked about it much. She did. She lived with her parents and had my mom while Mm -hmm. my grandmother was at war. And she saved all the money that became the down payment for my grandfather to start his company. And I believe that my grandmother was really smart. Mm -hmm. She was tenacious. And I think staying at home probably was not her calling no no and yet after the war was over she gave her job back she came into the kitchen she made some damn good cookies there you go damn good cookies chocolate chip those were my favorite and so that's what christian patriarchy project 2025 wants is a return to yeah to return to that yeah. But here but here's the thing. Is that this is all in service to the white Christian patriarch. This is not going to serve a non-white Christian patriarch it's or a even- or a non-white patriarch of any other, you know, religion this is just literally for white christian but patriarchs ding, ding, ding. it's not even gonna serve those poor white people it's no only not at all serve the one percent or two percent on the top of the pyramid this is a fucking pyramid scheme well right but here's the thing in a way it is because and this is how it gets marketed basically to at least poor white men is you're the head of your household you're in yeah. charge of something you're you over a something government assigned wife yeah you're over something like this is this is actually or not government assigned no it's father church. Assigned. it's like it's your it's church assigned it's father assigned it is somebody who is going to fit that mold so it's a it's a arranged marriage which we mock in other cultures, but it's okay in ours as long as it's called what do they call it? Uh, uh, courtship. Courtship. Yeah. 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 As long yeah. as we're doing a proper courtship, mm-hmm. which all of these women in these books have been subjected to. Mm-hmm. Don't make up your own mind. Nope. Nope. Not at all. And I just. The thing that that gets me in all of this, well, there's a lot of things. 
But one of the things is that it's this idea of if you don't follow these rules, you will go to hell. It's not, you know, oh, if you, I guess it is to some extent. It's not, oh, if you go murder people, you're going to hell. It's if you don't submit to your husband, you're going to hell. Wait a minute. Meanwhile, you're already living in hell. Right, exactly. <laughs> right, yeah. And I'm like, wait a minute. So the same place that's going to hold Jeffrey Dahmer is also going to hold me because I didn't submit. I'm sorry. I don't see these two crimes, crimes, like, you know, sub not submitting to a husband, in my opinion, is not a crime. But anyway, like, I don't see these two things as being equal. Oh, I said, I don't want to have sex with my husband. That's not equal to Jeffrey Dahmer, okay, like, but killing a bunch of people. But to be fair, you and I did not grow up in a household like this. You sure. had a feminist father who told me I could do anything that a boy could yeah. do. And yeah. you had a mother who was out ruling the world, taking <laughs> care of multiple families. And we were we were taught we went to a school where we were yeah. taught that we could do and be. Yeah. Meanwhile, these women from a very young age were they were on that on that blanket. They were being blanket yeah. trained. They were told they couldn't have a voice. Just think of the way that we were told we couldn't have a voice in this society and then multiply that by yeah, by thousands. Um, yeah. Yeah. Millions. Like you're not allowed to have a voice. You're not allowed to say no. And then okay, you're trained for all of that, then sexual abuse becomes rampant because you can't say no. You must submit. You must do mm -hmm. And by the way, it's your fault because they saw your ankle sticking out above your shoe and that turned that man on sexually and that's your fault. Yeah. And I have had a problem with, and I've even written a story about where purity culture crosses with sexual abuse because mm -hmm. culture teaches us that you did it. You yeah. did it by the very existence of showing your nose, the, your nose skin mm -hmm. to the force exaggerating, but no, I'm not because it doesn't matter what you do. Yeah. Yeah. You could put your entire body yeah. under a burlap sack and it would still be your fault in this purity culture mm -hmm. or any man having any desirous feelings towards you. Yeah. And instead of it being the man's fault because he's the patriarch. Yeah. He gets to do all, be all, see all. It's like a breeding ground for sexual abuse, actually. Absolutely. Absolutely. And in my sexual abuse, I wasn't even raised in such a culture. I still had trouble with the thought of purity culture and sexual abuse because what did I do? What did right. I do? When I was like two or three or four years old. What yeah. did I do? You know, that's one of the, the things that I find very interesting is the pervasive nature of purity culture, of, uh, you know, all of these ideals, you know, patriarchal ideas and how they they aren't just staying in these fundamentalist pockets like this is seeping into mainstream culture like purity culture and you know the duggars having a tv show yeah, and everybody well, being like what's up with the duggars let's see you know and this well, whole new like trad wife thing well didn't the duggars in a way like again you and i neither one of us watched it that much but they were splashed all over the media they were Everywhere. You couldn't swing a dead cat without seeing a dugger. So in a way, didn't that make it look like this coveted lifestyle? Yeah. Like, oh, this is if you live this way, your children will be sweet. They will behave. They will not have no problems. Your kids won't, your kids won't commit suicide. They won't be drug addicts. They won't, they'll get good grades. They'll do what you say. They'll follow. It's like this illusion. You'll have this life with no issues, yeah. Which is, which is downright 
preposterous and yeah. it's not human. No. It's not human to have a life without issues, no. but they sell it on this ticket. And the same thing, you're right. The same thing with all this trad wife stuff we're seeing. Yeah. You take your kids out of public education. So there's no bullying and you know, you don't have to worry about them getting marijuana from yeah, or, yeah, there's no bad influences no and bad influence. so you're at home and you're protected and it's all beautiful it's all this desire to stay safe that's yeah. what it boils down to that's why it's so attractive because we're we're being bombarded with all this stuff in the world about mm -hmm. war and inequity and all this stuff that is real and we're like oh my god how do i keep myself safe but then it amplifies when you have children. How do I keep my children safe? If someone could give me the magic bullet, that's why people join these churches. But you know what, though? Even in peace times, when the world is doing okay, and we're not actively at a war. But and... you don't have enough food. You yeah, don't have... but... yeah, but... So I get, I get what you're saying. I do. I get what you're saying. If but even when safe. time, right. But when things are generally okay, they still have a way to, it's the whole indoctrination of, if you don't follow these rules, you're going to hell. Right. So you're either talking about keeping your family safe from, you know, quote unquote, hell on earth. Like there's there's war and famine and disease, or you're keeping your family safe from hell in the afterlife. Right. So it's, it's, it's still based on fear, power over and entitlement. Of course. Yeah. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm asking nature, what do we do, but the nature, oh, go the ahead. nature of a human being, of being human, and I'm just coming into touch with this in my own life right now. The nature of a human being is there actually is suffering. Yeah. There actually is pain. There actually is fear, anger, suffering. There's also joy, love, et cetera, all the, what we label the bad and the good. Right. I think humans, the way our brains are wired is we're trying to figure out how not to suffer. Mm -hmm. If we can figure out this secret formula, for me, it's been spirituality, figuring out enlightenment, going to the next class, becoming mm -hmm. an enlightened person. If you're spiritual bypassing is what they call that. If you become yeah. so enlightened, you don't have to feel any of these feelings of grief and loneliness and rage and mm -hmm. but that isn't what we're here for on this earth right. we're here well, to be humans and the buddha would say reaching enlightenment doesn't mean that you're not going to suffer <laughs> exactly but but i think the reason we're all so drawn to these things is because we think this is the way to not suffer this is as the way opposed to we should be thinking this will this will give me a skill to survive the suffering yes to survive the suffering and i think it also that's that's what the whole war and the whole othering people is about too mm -hmm. it's like we look at these other countries and we're like we're suffering because they have it all or they're trying to take it or how mm -hmm. do i protect myself my and worth, wealth, wealth hoarding is right in there too. If oh, yeah. I if I hoard enough wealth, I'll be safe forever. No one can touch me if I own everything. Well, we just figured out the secret to the universe. Raquel. There you go. All right. Well, that <laughs> didn't take Our long. Done. <laughs> You're welcome, everybody. We just solved the world's problems. <laughs> well, I think... In a way, the truth is 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 what all of these women that in this high control religion that we've talked to have had to do, which mm -hmm. is number one, go within, mm -hmm. learn about themselves, yeah, sit with their suffering, sit with their pain, and realizing that 
Well, Tia says it in her book. She's like, I realized no one was coming to save me. Yeah. I had to do it for myself. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I wish I could find it because I, I, I underlined that almost exact thing. Um, yeah. And I wish, God, I wish I could find that because it would, the way that she wrote it, it was just so, it was just so beautiful the way that she wrote it. Um, yeah. But, you know, I was going to ask, okay, you know, well, then what do we do? What do we do about all this? Right. And I think one thing that we can do is we can encourage women like Tia and Kate and Sarah to continue to write about all of these topics. We can continue to support their work by reading it and talking about it and we can continue to yeah and we can continue to stay curious and oh, and and continue to learn and to talk that's the that's the only way that we that that's that's what we can do we can and we'll and vote and vote and and vote vote in our in our interests you know women have the right to vote still thank god they haven't taken that away yet um so we need to utilize it you know and i know in you know tia talked about it how the women didn't vote the head of the household voted and he voted for all of you yep you can vote for yourself. You can vote for yourself. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I think that's what we can do. So we don't have to, we don't have to feel hopeless about this kind of stuff. I mean, yeah, this is pretty big stuff and this is frightening and overwhelming but we have to stay curious about it and we have to continue to learn and we have to continue to vote and we have to continue to use our voices and advocate for ourselves and advocate for others and yeah I think that's what we 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 just have to continue doing that so that said everybody please read this book read this book it's it's very well written tia is a very talented writer yeah and i i, I can't wait to see what else happens for tia and what else she has to say well tia has a podcast it's called the wise jezebels nice and yeah. she is also in the process of writing her second book her second book yep which is about her healing process, how she came to be who she is now through therapy, writing, all kinds of things. I think what yeah. she said in regards to that is that she took every opportunity to try anything that might yeah. be appealing to her. Yeah, and which I think is amazing, by the way. I do too. And she also has really great social media. Her Substack talks about the um, fundamentalist patriarchy Mm -hmm. And things that are going on in our government right now and how mm -hmm. they how they're kind of a mirror for each other, how they're the mirror of what was happening inside the home is what our government wants to happen inside all of our homes. Yeah. Inside our government. Yeah. And I think yeah. following her on Instagram taught me a lot. Yeah. She yeah. She's yeah, she's really active on Instagram and very um yeah, she puts out a lot of really good content. I mean, that sounds like sounds like a watered down way of talking about what she does and what she talks about. But um, uh, she is a content creator, and she 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 does put out really really significant information. 
She's the first person I ever heard talk about the fundy voice, the women mm -hmm. using childlike voices that mm -hmm. are meant to be controlling, they're sexualized, etc. Mm -hmm. She also talks about religious trauma, purity culture, all of that is on her on her site. I suggest just following. I have learned so much from her. I yeah. didn't even really know this topic existed until oops, I held up the wrong book. This these are my notes. This is my book. <laughs> Yeah, but just, yeah, I, I want people to know too that it is very well written. Oh, yeah. Um, it is a very, very, uh, it's a very good read. I mean, Tia is incredibly talented. So, yeah, I mean, it's a heavy, it's a heavy topic, but um, it's very hopeful. And, you know, I have to say, Tia is a badass. I'm just gonna she put is. that right out there she is a badass and yeah she's she's doing what she needs to do to heal and heal generationally and and, and she's stop. what yeah. is she's a voice to say hey people pay attention yeah yeah so yeah it's a good book pick it up everybody this is good lovings read her book thank you yes tia. thank you tia for writing this book thank you for being vulnerable and sharing your experience and then helping other people bye raquel bye jennifer thanks everyone for listening today we will be back with more madness cafe next week you can find us on instagram at madness cafe podcast or email us at madness cafe podcast at gmail.com Bye.